Chapter 7 of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 Keel of Rip Van Winkle laid and shed built over it. Sawyers at work, getting timber to pit, etc. Reasons for and against a clench built yacht. How to ensure sleep on board one. The designing of the RVW. How her molds were connected with church restoration. We begin to make a show in the dockyard. And genteel people and nautical men visit it. An admiral does so. His advice. A retired ship owner's criticisms. The boat builder criticizes his critics. Why the RVW took some time to build. Steam called to our aid. The persuader. Riveting. Its effect upon visitors. Plan of RVW inside, etc. Getting a mast for her. I go in foam to Exmouth after a spar. Find one and after some trouble, pay for it. Tow it to Sidmouth. Strange behavior of spar on the voyage. Conant and I cut out some sails. Difficulties to be overcome in launching the RVW. How met, etc. Engage a crew for her. Invaluable qualities of William Barron. The keel of the Rip Van Winkle, in the meantime, still lay sleeping in the meadow opposite Sid House, and here it may be well to inform young readers, ignorant of the properties of wood used by their grandfathers in shipbuilding, that elm destined for underwater purposes even in the royal dockyards was not kept long seasoning before being converted into keel pieces or bottom plank it was however not till autumn that the yacht's keel was really laid in place under a temporary shed or roof fifty feet by twenty feet, in a piece of ground rented for the purpose behind the eastern end of the esplanade. This spot formed part of a coal and timber yard, and had large convenient saw pits close at hand. Unlike a house, one of the first cares of the prudent shipbuilder is his roof or deck material for which should all be cut out and even planed as long as possible before it is wanted. One of the first things, therefore, after starting the foundations of the yacht, was to select a clean balk of yellow pine and have it sawn into deck plank, which we planed on both sides and then carefully stowed away to dry. Some may ask here, but what can two men do in the way of converting timber into yacht? The answer is that all the heavier part of such conversion is done on the saw pit or by the saw mill so that the actual work of a civilized boat builder is upon plank and sided timber. That is, after it is cut of a certain thickness or technically sided so many inches. 
the yacht builder then placing his delicately curved moulds upon it and after lining it by them working it to the required form with hand saw and adze unless the piece be thick enough to pay for again putting it on the saw pit sawyer's work is paid by the superficial foot each cut counting twice the number of feet in the length of the piece multiplied by the depth of it sawyer's bills therefore formed the largest items in the cost of the earlier stages of the work the getting a piece of timber to pit and clamping it firmly in position with iron dogs was always a work of time and as the boat builder looked upon heart of oak as more valuable than time a long discussion generally ensued as to the exact direction the line struck upon it by a worsted yarn saturated in wet charcoal should take in order to make the most of the piece especially in the case of crooked limbs or the butt of a tree with a slight turn in it but these preliminaries once settled the long steady swish of a half rip saw soon reduced the largest timber into handy plank it was chiefly on account of the lightness of the work and small amount of timber required in proportion to the strength of hull that the old clench way of building was decided upon for the rip van winkle though even within the memory of old yachtsmen this style of work was known as cutter built i have been told indeed that the celebrated arrow was originally clench built modern yachting sybarites have however long decided that life would not be worth living in such vessels sleep being out of the question in one on account of the rippling of the water against her overlapping planks by going to sea however a trifle short-handed so as to give plenty of work as well as play for all on board some sound sleep may be enjoyed according to my experience by the watch below in even a clench built craft so far nothing has been said about the incubation or hatching out of the designs of the rip van winkle on paper in lines evolved upon a half-block model after many days and quires of glass paper had been consumed in reducing that model to the form which would combine the largest boat in the smallest compass in small boat work the form is dependent more upon the builder's eye than upon lines or moulds but the side of a vessel forty-five feet long is too large a surface to be taken in at a glance six strong cross-sectional moulds were therefore made from lines drawn in chalk and enlarged from the block model upon the floor of an empty room and as luck would have it our old church had just undergone restoration resulting in a crop or litter of small gothic vestries springing up round its solid old saxon tower and after the local contractor had done his work he had on hand several wooden arch centerings the radius of which coincided happily with the curves of the moulds we wanted they were therefore bought of him for a few shillings and converted into cross-sectional moulds 
to be set up on our keel as guides for the eye during the time that plank by plank the r v w unfolded slowly upwards from her keel this keel was thirty-eight feet long by one foot six inches deep aft and one foot forward it was eight inches wide on top and six at the bottom and after having a groove worked in it for the first plank was secured upon the blocks with the oak stem and stern posts erected at either end so that when the six moulds were in place a fair notion of the size and character of our craft could be formed or as the boat builder said we begin to make a show so far genteel people in our watering place had paid no more attention to these early numbers of my yacht than genteel people did before the flood to the early stages of noah's ark while the few that had heard of her had never regarded her as a fabric really destined to float but when it became known that the keel was really laid nearly all the greater nautical authorities of the place felt it a duty to visit our dockyard and at once pour cold water enough upon our undertaking to have floated an ironclad first in rank and importance came the retired admiral of our reading-room and whist club with very preconceived ideas on naval architecture indeed but at the same time full of sound impracticable advice and warning such as the danger of dry rot proving fatal to my craft soon after she was afloat as it did seventy years ago to an american frigate most urgent also was he to impress me with the vast importance of large scuppers and at any cost half a dozen ports three feet square in our bulwarks to allow the sea to escape from the deck on stormy nights in place of sending her to the bottom as it did many of these ten-gun brigs you know scuppers were that admiral's favorite hobby so that it was painful to him to hear that the r v w would be almost without bulwarks and that a roomy open cockpit or well-room aft we intended giving her would be large enough to hold and keep on board until pumped out the biggest sea she was ever expected to ship a more trying critic was my friend a retired merchant and sea captain a practical and positive man who spoke with authority having built and owned tons of shipping he had all lloyd's rules at his finger ends and as he had no further use for them now kindly presented me with some of their old tables giving the relative endurance of timber and showing as he said at a glance how long a vessel built as i proposed would be classed a one etc but as on referring to them it was clear that the r v w would never be classed at lloyd's at all and that according to these rules her timbers ought to be rotten in less time than she would take me to build they were not used then again as to cost he pointed out with great truth that my expenses would really only begin when the hull of the yacht was completed my assistant the boat builder had hitherto been only accustomed to work at home under the eye of a favorite black tomcat 
and rather winced at finding the dockyard in danger of becoming a popular afternoon lounge for people he termed gap mouths so that it was in the quiet morning hours especially between six and eight a m that with the silent help of our handy billies or tackles most of the heavier stages of work were got over though never interrupted by strikes work in our dockyard was far from being continuous the boat builder had other boats to build and repair and when he was thus employed all work upon the r v w was done by the foreman with at times the help of a boy or man to hold up a maul against the heads of the many copper and galvanized iron nails to be riveted the entire number of planks on a side from keel to gunwale of the yacht was twenty and one plank fitted and nailed fore and aft on both sides usually took two days so that had the work been continuous her outer shell might have been completed in about forty days but as the yacht grew in height scaffolding had to be rigged round her and work done upon it did not progress quite as fast as that which could be reached from the ground most of the first and heavier part of the labor however such as fitting the stout four-inch cross-floor timbers and deadwoods was done without the use of staging another source of delay was that all our ironwork and even the larger nails and bolts were made by a local smith and sent to bristol to be galvanized the inner timbers or ribs of the yacht with the exception of twelve floor timbers were all bent into place after the outer planking was completed these timbers were three inches by two inches thick and before being bent had of course to be subjected to steam heat for some hours and as they were stouter than anything the boat builder had handled special appliances had to be used for the job the first of these was a long narrow box or trunk of inch elm supported on trestles over a washerwoman's boiler or copper seated upon bricks this was provided with a closely fitting wooden cover and was connected with the steaming trunk by a short bit of iron gas pipe the timbers were twelve feet long and six were steamed at a time the fire under the boiler being kept up for four or five hours whenever one of these batches of ribs was ready the extra help of two hands from the beach was engaged because the bending and nailing of each rib had to be done in ten minutes or while the wood was hot all the holes for the nails through the planking were bored ready none being required in the timbers provided the nails were driven through them while hot the boat builder always drove these nails outside the boat while i and a strong hand inside forced the timber into place in doing which we also used a contrivance of mine of which as it answered its purpose well i have given a sketch it consisted of a light pole or lever long enough to reach from the keel inside the boat and project over her top plank some six or eight feet the lower end of this lever was fitted with an iron hook and the outer end had a small block seized upon it a short sliding gaff about two feet six long was rigged with jaws on the pole inside the boat and when used 
the hook in the lower end worked in a temporary eye-bolt screwed into the keel inside the boat abreast of where the timbers were to be bent a rope was then passed through the block at the outer end of the pole one end of which was made fast to a heavy weight on the ground while the other end was used by a boy to pull down upon the end of the lever as directed by those inside the boat the end of the short gaff being applied by them to any part of the hot timber where more power was wanted to bend it than could be got by mere strength of hand foot or knee we christened this contrivance the persuader because by it the most obstinate timber was either forced into place or broken this however only happened once during the work of steaming in those who had to handle these timbers as they came hot and hot from the steam trunk had their hands protected by thick woolen mitts besides some shorter ones forty of these timbers were bent hot into the boat each being fastened to her planking by two stout four and a half inch galvanized iron nails between them the planking was fastened by two and a half inch copper nails all of which were riveted upon washers or roves inside the number of these rivets was at least thirty five hundred none of the boat builders time was ever wasted upon this tedious work most of it indeed was done in his absence by the foreman of the yard who observed that whenever the riveting hammer was at work the most inveterate lounger rarely remained long under the building shed from the earliest numbers of the r v w every bit of new work was at once well paid or painted over with a mixture of stockholm tar boat varnish and linseed oil the application of which aromatic preservative was a pleasant relaxation for arm and ear after a spell of riveting as soon as the planking and timbering of the hull was finished it was followed by the heavy work of fitting a stout oak gunwale inside the top plank into which the ends of the deck beams were fitted and tied to the sides of the boat by strong oak and iron knees or brackets then followed the laying of the deck with a raised hatch eighteen feet long by eight feet wide and one foot high built into it amidships abaft the mast beyond this hatch aft a space twelve feet long by eight feet wide was left open as a well-room or cockpit round which the lockers were fitted the cabin doors opened into this cockpit upon a platform raised two feet above the floor of the cabin the height or headroom in the cabin under this hatch was a little over six feet the accompanying longitudinal plan gives the arrangement of the saloon ladies cabin and forecastle of the r v w some time before these internal fittings were carried out in the plainest style of varnished yellow pine the materials for masts sails and rigging were got together owing however to the length sixty feet of mast required for the pole rig of the yacht i had some difficulty in procuring a suitable spar at a reasonable price my friend the retired ship-owner 
kindly offered his services in the shape of an introductory letter to a london firm of spar makers from which i was to get my mast at cost price the answer of that firm was of such a character which would have brought the price of this important number of the r v w to a figure out of all proportions to any of the preceding numbers therefore after consulting the boat builder i determined upon a voyage to exmouth in the foam to look for a stick there was a nice breeze off the land on a lovely summer morning when with a five-pound note in my pocket and some bread and cheese for the voyage i and a young shipwright's apprentice a lad named hart and one of the few saved in the boat of the steamship london which foundered in the bay of biscay left sidmouth for exmouth in search of a mast including a beat up the river this little voyage was usually made in two hours and we reached the nearest landing to some timber ponds at exmouth soon after eleven there were the ponds with plenty of long spars afloat in them but no owner or even a house was to be seen near these solitary salt lagoons and it was only after wandering some distance that I found a fisherman drying his nets, who directed me to a small shipwright's yard where I found the proprietor of the spars caulking an old pilot cutter, who in the course of time condescended to go and look them over with me. We measured nearly every likely stick more than once, before finding one the required length and size, and even this had an ugly kink near the small end. It was, however, sixty-five feet long, and one in diameter at the butt end. So, though, like the rent in Peep's cloak, this kink troubled me, I agreed at last to give the man three pounds eight shillings for it when afloat in the river this with the aid of a horse and pair of wheels was after some delay done and then came the hardest part of the whole business that of getting change for my five pound note which was only obtained after another long hot walk over heavy sand to a small riverside public house and the purchase of a quart of the worst cider i ever tasted the owner of the spar was however equal even to the cider and after drinking it called for pens and inks and scrawled me out a receipt for three pounds eighteen shillings the long rough-barked pine tree as it lay afloat alongside her made the foam look very small and the shipwright asked what i was going to do with the spar i said of course tow it to sidmouth this led to a discussion as to the best way of doing so the chief point in which was to be sure and make my tow rope fast to the big end of the spar therefore after some manoeuvring to get that end astern of the foam and toward the sea we started with a fair wind out of the axe we had not gone more than a mile before i found that owing to the slight turn in it the spar was constantly rolling over and fast untwisting my tow-line spinning in fact like an enormous minnow astern of the boat i then tried two tow-lines one over each quarter 
but this did not mend matters much and the faster we went the quicker the spar spun round i therefore hauled down my sails and took it in tow by the small end things went on better after this until we got clear of the river into the swell of the channel upon which the spar at once showed inclination to run with its long nose above water and charge the foam astern and was near so doing that i decided to try and lift the small end of it out of water and lash it down on top of her stern she had fine wide quarters and with some ballast shifted forward made nothing of the weight of the spar from this time i had no more trouble the long stick when it ran upon a sea even seemingly to help us forward and we made the passage of ten miles home quite an hour sooner than harry conant who had proposed meeting us in his boat halfway expected he only met us a short distance from sidmouth and finding on taking us in tow that his boat would not keep a tow-line taut he therefore cast off and landing before us was ready to help haul the future mast of the r v w up the beach after which a few days application of draw knife jack and trying plane soon licked this rough stick into shape as i said before harry conant was a first-rate rigger and sailmaker and furnished with a sail plan and measuring tape he and i contrived for want of a regular sail loft to cut out all the sails of the r v w in a smooth pasture meadow several months before she was launched conant working upon them and rigging at home in his leisure hours like many of our great ironclads the r v w was not launched with a rush but gently floated off shore by the tide one difficulty of this job was that between where she lay upon the blocks and the sea the ground rose more than six feet toward the esplanade and sea-wall from which of course the beach fell rapidly seaward in order therefore to get her over this embankment she was placed upon a strong axle tree fitted with a pair of solid wooden trucks or low wheels like those of an old ship's gun carriage this axle tree was placed under her rather forward of a midships and was strong enough to carry her weight about six tons and long enough to support chocks at both ends cut to fit the boat's bottom and hold her upright both ends of this axle tree were well stayed fore and aft at right angles to the keel the after end of which rested and moved upon short rollers placed under it a double block tackle was then rigged from the yacht to the sea wall the fall or end of which was taken to a capstan on the esplanade by means of which two men were able to slowly heave her and the cradle on to the esplanade the remainder of her journey seaward was downhill, and the same tackle reversed was used to check her way as she descended slowly to low water mark. Before, however, a day was decided on for this final move from a place of safety on the sea walk, the barometer and look of the sky was carefully noted in order to make quite sure of fine weather and smooth water as under any circumstances there would have been a risk of total loss before she even floated 
the tide also had to be considered not merely with a view to depth of water but for time to lower her down ballast her with shingle and jury rig her before she started for exmouth to be masted and complete her fit out there afloat a launch or rather a floating off of this kind of course created little public excitement but on the day fixed for it i had no want of first-rate willing hands to help carry it out among the fishermen from among whom i had now engaged an old friend as the permanent crew of the r v w and had i gone the world over it would have been hard to find a better man afloat or ashore than my sturdy multum in parvo william baron a first-rate beach man a good shoemaker who had served on board a revenue cutter was a good house and ship painter and had been a gentleman's servant he was then in the prime of life and one of the most cheerily tempered fellows possible and looking at his portrait taken this year seems to have remained so ever since baron must be now nearer eighty than seventy and yet last summer he started one morning at five a m by excursion train from sidmouth to pay us one of his usual visits after having spent the night at sea with his prawn nets and arrived at southampton as fresh as the basket of prawns he brought with him my second hand or mate was a young exmouth pilot just out of his apprenticeship of the name of tupman but he did not join the yacht until she was fitted out ready for sea at exmouth to which port baron assisted by conant and his son was to take charge of her. End of chapter 7